All right. I'll follow you. Okay. <laughs> Y'all ready? Did you get an OK address? If you want to go now. I haven't spoken in front of an audience this big in a while, and I was like in the shower this morning, like, okay, I'm gonna plan an awkward joke and make everyone laugh, and then I'm gonna feel a lot better. And I got here and I don't remember the joke that I was gonna make. <laughs> and so now it's just awkward, which is what Chris's joke was five minutes ago for me, so thanks for laughing. I'm Jacqueline Flowen. I am the executive director of the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center, which is a local organization here in Missoula. We've been in the community for 35 years. Um, we've done a lot of different types of things in the community, but overall our mission is to work towards a world that is more socially just, environmentally sustainable, um, and racially just as well. And we are under a bit of a transition. Um, I've been in this role for eight months, so we've been kind of shaking and changing things up a bit. Um, with all of you in the audience, if you're interested in nonprofit work or government work or getting into any form of institution, um, you do have the power to change it. And I hope it's at conferences and, and experiences like these where you learn how to, um, where you feel empowered to do so, where you see young people like myself doing things that you guys could be doing in five years or 10 years um, or even sooner. Um, so I'm excited to be here with all of you, uh, and I want to go ahead and I'll say a couple more things about the Peace Center and then I'll introduce um, Ambassador Ted Osius. Uh, we have a fair trade store, which is at the Hip Strip, which I don't know how many of y'all are Missoulians, but um, it's right downtown. And in this fair trade store, our goal is to provide opportunities for ethical purchasing. Um, so, generally speaking, your, a fair trade certification requires you to have 85% of the products that you're selling in your store to be certified fair trade. What that means is that um, it takes out all of these middle men and women in between. So, we work with an organization or the individual who produces the item works with an organization who certifies them, which means they get fair wages. Working conditions have been checked. Um, we know that they are, are not working in sweatshops. Um, and it generally only requires one person in between the transactions. So you have the producer on the ground who can be anywhere in the world, um, the certification, and then a, store, a fair trade store. So instead of something when, you know, my last purchase on Amazon could have 25 people in the middle of that transaction, depending upon where the materials came from and how it was transported and who's actually making money on it, with the fair trade certification, you're able to eliminate that process and ensure that the folks are getting paid what they deserve. Um, so if you're in town for a few days and you want to pick something up with some really cool cheap bumper stickers that are actually from local artisans, um, we have some ecologically sustainable products as well, um, and most of the items are fair trade. Uh, we have started working on some indigenous art programming recently, uh, which is a part of the reason why I'm really excited for uh, the ambassador today, because I think it's really important for us to have complicated and nuanced discussions around what it means to be doing peace work and peace building on stolen land or in conflict areas. So what is the United States role in these positions? The power dynamic, let's talk about that. Um, imperialism is real, and uh, we, we can't deny that as we move forward in peace building. And so I'm really hoping that today we get to get to hear a little bit about how to do that, um, and that y'all ask some really good, complex questions to the ambassador that we have today. Um, ambassador Ted Osius is a, has been a diplomat. Ooh, I'm going to take some deep breaths. <laughs> if you're ever up here, deep breaths are always a good idea. Okay. A diplomat for nearly 30 years, Ted Osius served from 2014 to 2017 as U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, a country he has loved since serving there in the 1990s when he helped open the U.S. Consulate General 
in Ho Chi Minh City and was one of the first U.S. diplomats at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi. Leading a mission team of 900, Ambassador Osius devised and implemented strategies to deepen security ties, signs tens of billions of dollars worth of commercial deals, expand educational exchange, conclude agreements on trade, law enforcement, environmental protection, and address honestly a difficult past. Ambassador Osius's leadership helped bring about a positive transformation in U.S.-Vietnam relations. As he worked to improve U.S.-Vietnam relations, Ambassador Osius came to know the heroes who sought to reconcile our nations, including John Kerry, John McCain, Pete Peterson, and Lee Van Bang. Under four presidents and seven secretaries of state, Ambassador Osius contributed to the reconciliation not just between governments, but between former combatants and the people of both nations. The first openly gay U.S. ambassador to serve in East Asia, he was only the second career diplomat in U.S. history to achieve that rank. Ambassador Osius earned a bachelor's degree from Harvard University, a master's degree from John Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies, and an honorary doctorate from Ho Chi Minh City University of Technology and Education. A member of the Board of Governors of the American Chamber of Commerce, Commerce Vietnam, Ambassador Osius loves all kinds of travel, biking, sailing, theater, and photography. He is married to Clayton Allen Bond, and the couple has a three-year-old daughter and four-year-old son. Um, so without further ado, one last little piece here. I do want to mention that this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media assistance grant that was donated to the Montana World Affairs Council by MCAT. Um, so without further ado, can you help me welcome Ambassador Ted Osius, please? Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm happy to see that uh, some of the students are going to go to Vietnam later this year uh, as part of the Mansfield Center program are here today. They are lucky. Uh, because it's a really fascinating place. So I'm going to talk about working for peace through legacies of war with three examples. I'm going to talk a little bit about fullest possible accounting of those who we lost in the war. I'm going to talk about cleaning up unexploded ordnance, and I'm going to talk about dioxin, which is a residue left behind from Agent Orange, a defoliant. But those are the examples. What I want you to listen for are three themes. One is the power of relationships. What relationships mean when it comes to peace building. The second is something that Jacqueline referred to, and that's being honest about the past. And the third aspect I want you to listen for is the what, what, what it requires sometimes to get something done, which is courage. So I'm going to talk first about relationships and about fullest possible accounting. And I'm going to start with a story of two people whom Jacqueline mentioned, one a Republican and one a Democrat. They were, in 1991, they were on a flight from, uh, to, to, from the United States to Kuwait to look at the results of Desert Storm. Uh, and they were seated next to each other on the plane just by accident. And one was a Democrat, and one was a Republican. Uh, the Democrat was John Kerry, and the Republican was John McCain. And they didn't particularly like each other. They, in fact, when John Kerry had run for Senate, John McCain, who was a member of Congress, had shown up in Massachusetts and, and campaigned against him. And they had come from very different positions when it came to the searing experience that shaped both of their lives, which was the Vietnam War. So John McCain was a son and a grandson of admirals. And in 1967, he was shot down over Trukbak Lake in Hanoi. And I want you to put yourselves in his mind for just a moment. He was, he was uh, dropping bombs on the city of Hanoi uh, at 
how she was trying to blow up an electric plant. And he was, when he was, his plane was hit, he was ejected very forcibly, so forcibly that he broke both of his arms and one of his legs. And this is even before he hit the water. And he hit the water very hard. And then the people who came out and pulled him to shore were not really so much interested in his well-being. He had, after all, been dropping bombs on their families. So by the time they dragged him to shore, he also had a bayonet wound in the groin. One of his bones was protruding from his leg. He was in pretty bad shape. And he was dragged off to a place called Hualo Prison, better known for those who look at American history as the Hanoi Hilton. That was, it, it was Hualo means fiery furnace, and it was a prison that had been used by the French to imprison those Vietnamese who fought for independence against the French. Now it's being used to imprison American soldiers. And once he got there, uh, he was, as I mentioned, in bad shape. He was nursed to health by some of the other prisoners. He received no medical attention, no anesthetic. His bones were set such as it was without any anesthetic, no dressing for his wounds. The only way he, he stayed alive was that people like Bob Craner, who was in the cell next to his, kept you know, saying, John, hang on, hang on, you can make it. A few months later, he was taken before the warden of the prison. By then, the warden had figured out who he was. He said, I know who you are. You, Lieutenant, are the, the son of Admiral John McCain, and you can go. And McCain was about 100 pounds at that point. He'd shrunk it. He was very near death. And the warden was saying, you can go. And McCain said, wait a minute, the code of conduct of American soldiers is that the first person go, who goes in is the first person to go out. So he went, he said, wait a minute, let me think about this, Mr. Warden. And he went back and talked to Bob Craner next to him. And he said, Bob, what do I do? And Bob said, you know, John, you are exempt because if you stay here, you'll die. So you don't have to worry about the code. You are exempt from the code. You can go, you can go. McCain went back to the warden and said, I have to stay. The, the, the code and my honor as a soldier requires me to stay. And the warden said, you know, it's going to get really bad for you. You think it was bad before. It's going to get really bad now. And it did. And they broke more of his ribs, tortured him, and put him in solitary where he spent two and a half of the next six years. But he didn't die. He survived that ordeal. Now, why do I tell you this in, in such detail? Uh, because when I was nominated to become the sixth ambassador to Vietnam, I went to see John McCain. There was one vote that mattered for my confirmation, and that was the vote of John McCain. And I went and I, I sought his support to become the sixth ambassador. And during that meeting, he grabbed me by the arm and he walked me over to a framed telegram on the wall. And in the telegram it said, Admiral McCain's son was offered the chance to leave Hualo Prison and he, he turned the warden down. And I wondered at the time, why is he showing me this? We all, I had heard this story, I had read about this story, why is he showing me this? And then I realized, well, he's telling me who he is. He's telling me about the most important decision of his life, the one that defined who he was from that point on. And so go back again to 1991. He's sitting opposite John Kerry, but a very different experience in Vietnam. Came uh, back from the war. He was an avid anti-war protester. Unlike John McCain, he never said if we prosecuted the war harder, we, we would have won. He felt the war was wrong to begin with. But th these two men, coming from very different vantage points, decided that actually peace was worth, was worth sacrificing for. And they both took huge risks politically. 
This guy, John McCain, who had been through all of that agony that I just described, was called a Manchurian candidate. And fellow veterans threw vegetables at him and eggs, and they, they called him all kinds of names. They said he was a traitor. He was treasonous because he wanted to bring about peace with Vietnam. But he, for him, I think honor and duty was bigger than his own political future. It would have been much easier for him to stay on the side of most Republicans, most members of his party at that time, and oppose normalization of relations with Vietnam, but he didn't do that. Uh, and at that time, politically, this was the time of the Rambo films. And I don't know if many of you have, have seen those, but they were films that glorified this idea that there were American prisoners being held in Southeast Asia against their will. And people like Bob Dole, who was running for president against Bill Clinton, people like Jesse Helms, Bob Smith, the senators who, who opposed normalization were vehement against John McCain. They, they pilloried him for having joined hands with a Democrat to, tr to talk about uh, resumption of relations or establishment of normal diplomatic relations with an old enemy. And John McCain and John Kerry set out to prove a negative. They had to prove that there were no people being held in tiger cages in Southeast Asia. Now, this was a difficult thing to do. We didn't have any kind of ties with Vietnam. For 20 years, we hadn't had any ties. And yet they traveled many times to Vietnam, and they insisted on going everywhere where leads took them, and the Vietnamese let them go everywhere. They said, okay, you've got a lead, you can go to whatever place you want, you can look in whatever archives you want, we will open, basically open up the store to you. And they set up a select committee on POW MIA affairs, and they proved, except to the people really on the furthest fringes, they proved that there were no, there was nobody being held against his will in Southeast Asia. And they paved the way for the creation of normal diplomatic relations. A relationship between a brave, patriotic Republican and a brave, patriotic Democrat was what allowed us to go from being enemies with Vietnam to what we are now, which is really close friends and partners. So that's, that's part one about relationships. Now let me let me talk a little bit about unexploded ordnance. When when we waged war against Vietnam, the United States dropped more tonnage, more bombs, actually three times more tonnage on a country the size of New Mexico, the size of the state of New Mexico, than we did on all of Europe and all of Africa during World War II. Three times as much. So we blanketed that country with unexploded ordnance. And the first, when people thought about this, they thought, well, it's just impossible. The whole country is covered with unexploded ordnance, so we can't really do anything about it. But Bill Clinton made a trip after establishing normal diplomatic relations to Vietnam. He made a trip to Hanoi, and I went with him. And he, and he said, we're going to start the, the, the job of cleanup. We're going to work with you, people of Vietnam, to ensure that your farmers no longer, when they're digging in the soil, come across a bomb that causes them to lose their hands. No more kids play with, with uh, unexploded ordnance and lose their eyes. And we set out in the year 2001 to accomplish that task of cleaning up, especially a province called Quang Tri, right along the DMZ. And I was able, as, as ambassador in 2015, to go and see, and travel around that province and see the work of these deminers who were going in and blowing up unexploded ordnance piece by piece in place so that farmers could keep their hands and kids could keep their eyes. It was a big job, and I think now we can safely say that Quang Tri is impact free. Now, that wasn't without cost. One of the people I met when I went in 2015 was a man named Hiet, who was one of the deminers 
And nine months after I met him, uh, he lost his life. And he was being very, very, very safe, as they always were. But sometimes accidents happen. He lost his wife, uh, his life, and uh, he left behind two kids and a, and a wife. He shouldn't have lost his life, and neither should we have dropped three times more tonnage on that little country than we had in all of World War II. Um, but it took courage for him to, to go out there and try to, to make sure that his province was impact free, that no longer would, would uh, uh, people lose their lives or their limbs uh, to unexploded ordinance. Since that time in 2001, when Bill Clinton declared that we were going to do the cleanup, we have done so without ceasing through the, through the work of NGOs and through support from the US government and uh, working with Vietnam's military. And we've expanded that work to other provinces, such as Tua Tien Hue and Ha Ten province near Hong Chi, uh, so that, again, Vietnam can be impact-free. No longer will people lose their lives to unexploded ordinance. But it took a lot of courage uh, for that to happen. The last piece of the story I'm going to tell you is about Baps. And when we were in Vietnam, the United States dropped a defoliant called Agent Orange on many parts of the country. And the defoliant stripped away the forests so that we could find the enemy. But it also left behind a residue called dioxin that uh, once it gets into the human bloodstream, stays there forever. And in fact, we now, scientists have now proven it passes on from generation to generation to generation, to the fourth generation, at least. And it causes terrible uh, birth defects. And it, uh, uh, it lasts a long time. So another person of courage, the head of the Ford Foundation, a man named Charles Bailey, went out also to prove a negative. We went out to prove what was happening as a result of dioxin in Vietnam. And this was politically like the third rail. You weren't allowed to talk about dioxin. I went to Vietnam in 2001 as a fairly junior official for science and technology exchange, and I was told in no uncertain terms, don't use the word dioxin or Agent Orange when you're talking to Vietnamese officials. This is kind of stunning to me that we couldn't we couldn't speak honestly about what had happened in the past. But the third U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, a man named Michael Marine, seized that third rail. He said, "We we've, we've got to talk about the past," and he used the work of Charles Bailey, who who looked at the problem of dioxin and found where the hot spots were in Vietnam to say, we can do something about this. No, the country isn't soaked with dioxin everywhere. It's not that every time you, you eat rice from Vietnam, you're going to be ingesting dioxin. There are three places in the country where there was still a high concentration of, of dioxin. In fact, in two of those places, people were still fishing from ponds that had dioxin in them, eating the fish or eating the ducks that ate the fish and still ingesting this toxin this toxic substance that really condemned them and their families forever. So uh, these two men, uh, Mike Marine and Charles Bailey, persuaded President Bush when he went to Vietnam to talk honestly about the accident. And in 2011, the fourth U.S. ambassador to Vietnam, a man named Mike Mihalik, uh, agreed with the government that we would start a cleanup project in a place called Da Nang. And it's kind of complicated to get rid of dioxin. Um, you basically, we built an oven the size of a football field outside of Danang Airport, and we put dirt into it, huge amount of dirt, and we heated it up to 323 degrees Celsius for six weeks. That's a lot of electricity. That's the hell, a hell of an oven. Uh, but I was able to go there in 2016. Actually, I went there a couple of times. But the last time I went there was in 2016, and I was able to plunge my hands into the dirt, hold it up for the cameras, say, this is safe. This isn't going to hurt anybody anymore. And I have 
I have two small children, as you just heard. I wouldn't have done that if it weren't safe. Um, but people of courage made sure we addressed that problem. Except it wasn't fully addressed. The, I mentioned there were three hotspots. Two of them had been cleaned up or covered up so no one was being hurt anymore. The biggest one when I got there was a place called Bien Hoa and had no longer, it had not, it had not been cleaned up. It was so big, there was so much dioxin in the soil that uh, it was going to be very, very costly to clean it up. So I went to that place as well. And I saw along a stream kids playing in the mud. And our delays in dealing with that challenge meant those kids were condemned. Those kids were going to be exposed to dioxin. That meant their children, their children's children, their children's children's children. And that's a, a result of us being very slow about being honest about the past. I went to uh, I went to Secretary Tillerson, uh, who was Secretary of State at that time, and I said, "We have to deal with this. We have to deal with this honestly." And I got back a response: "No money, no U.S. funds are going to be spent on this." And I kept going. I went to Secretary Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense, and I said, "We have to clean this up. We, if we want a real relationship with Vietnam, we have to be honest about the past." And uh, the lawyers at the Department of Defense said, oh, no, we would open ourselves up to, to lawsuits if we did that. Well, we hadn't then opened ourselves up to lawsuits when we cleaned up Danang. And so I kept resisting. And I had an ally, one, a great ally, a guy named uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, who never gave up when it came to addressing the legacies of war. And he had an aide, uh, Tim Reeser. Who had, and he and I had gone to the same high school, and we just we kept plotting, and we said well, we're not letting this go. And my team kept saying, "No, Master, we're not going to let this go. We're going to keep we're going to keep trying until we can get this done." And finally, we did. Finally, we got agreement. We got the funds, and we began cleaning up Bien Hoa. But it required a lot of persistence and a lot of determination. Uh, to to, uh, to to take that last step in being honest about the past. So I hope these lessons are helpful. It's not actually turns out it's not easy sometimes to be to be honest about the past. You want to brush it under the rug, and for many years people wanted to ignore the issue of dioxin because it was expensive and hard, and it had been expensive in this country to treat our soldiers who've been exposed to, to dioxin, and it was going to be very expensive to deal with it in Vietnam, and people preferred not to. But I believe the only way you can create a new relationship is by being honest, honest with each other, being honest about the past. So I wrote a book uh, called Nothing is Impossible about this, this arc of reconciliation between the United States and Vietnam from 1991 and that airplane flight uh, to the present day. And it's all stories about people. Because in, in my view, it was people who had the courage to say, it's worth fighting for peace. It's worth taking risks for peace, who were able to transform our relationship from one of enmity to one, of, uh, one that's a very close friendship today. I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Please. How has the legacy of the Sino Vietnamese conflict and the Khmer Rouge affected us, you, and the Vietnamese? Thank you. For those of you who didn't hear the Sino Vietnamese conflict, how might that have affected us, Cambodia, and the Khmer Rouge, and maybe what would be the implications today? So I'm going to roll back. Did I, did I rephrase that properly? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, roll back in Vietnamese history. The Vietnamese fought 22 times against China, 22 wars against China over the millennia. And the most recent one 
was from 1979 to 1991. And people forget that because it was at, we were no longer paying that much attention to Vietnam. But every year, thousands of Vietnamese and Chinese soldiers died along the northern border of Vietnam as they fought over that war. A very bloody long war. It is in the DNA of the Vietnamese to resist domination by any other country, especially their neighbor to the north. The, the streets of the villages and the cities in Vietnam are named Tran Hung Dao, Ngo Quyen, Ba Chiu, Hai Ba Trung, all heroes, men and women, who fought against Chinese invaders. And the, the history of Vietnam is full of stories, sort of David and Goliath stories, of those who stood up to the giant neighbor to the north. And really, that is a bigger part of, a bigger and more significant part of their history, even than resistance against French colonialists and American imperialists, which is what they refer to us as. Uh, it's, it's very, very important. And, and I ask, ask myself, well, how come nobody explained this to John Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson? when they were thinking about what to do in Vietnam. How come nobody explained that the domino theory didn't really make sense? Because the Vietnamese have in their DNA this desire to, to resist the Chinese. And the answer goes back to McCarthyism. 1954, the height of McCarthyism. Anybody who was an expert on China was drawn out of the US government. And so the, uh, the, those two presidents, Kennedy and Johnson, weren't getting very good advice from people who actually understood the history of the country that we just, where we decided to go to war. Now, you mentioned the Cambodians from uh, 1979 to 1989, Vietnam invaded and occupied Cambodia. It's because the Khmer Rouge had taken over and were engaged in genocide and then had begun attacking Vietnam at its border. So they made the decision that they had to go in to protect their own territory. And while they're in there, they were going to root out the Khmer Rouge and install a puppet government. And the United States objected uh, to this invasion and objected to the alliance that Vietnam secured with Russia at the time, or the Soviet Union at the time. And as a result, slowed down what might have been a process of normalization that might have begun in the 1970s and pushed it off to the 1990s. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Up here. Okay, so um, you know, earlier this year, after the fall of Afghanistan and the evacuation from Kabul, I heard a lot of comparison between what happened when we left Afghanistan and what happened when we evacuated from Vietnam. Do you believe that this is an accurate comparison? And if so, how do you think we should learn from our interactions with Vietnam in order to move towards reconciliation quicker with the people of Afghanistan? Thank you. Thanks very much for that question. Um, I wrote down some, some notes from uh, uh, Mike McKinley's talk yesterday. And there were a number of times when what he was saying about what happened in Kabul could very easily have been said about Vietnam. He's talked about American policymakers misreading what was happening in the country. He described it as an eroding stalemate. That could very easily describe what was happening in Vietnam. He described the corruption of the regime in Kabul, which you could also use to describe the regime in, in, uh, in Saigon, South Vietnam. He described the finite ability of the United States to change <coughs> Afghanistan. You could also talk about the finite ability of the United States to change Vietnam. And he urged us to think about occasionally respecting the enemy thinking about what it is that the enemy is trying to do, understanding what it is the enemy that is, is trying to do. So there are many differences. And I've written a book that talks about 
it's, it's very important to understand the culture and the history of a place if you want to really understand it. And I do not pretend that I understand <coughs> the culture and the history of Afghanistan. Uh, Ambassador McKinley is way better than that. But I think we can draw some lessons. Uh, one of the lessons is if you are seen to be an invader, there will be resistance. We were the outsider in Vietnam. We were the outsider in Afghanistan. We may have had the best intentions in the world in the world for both of those societies, but we were not able to ever take on the mantle of a, of a nationalist because we were foreigners. So in, in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, who, uh, who was, had, had gone to Paris and learned something about communism uh, in France, took on the mantle of nationalism, Vietnamese nationalism. And really, there wasn't any way that we were going to be able to defeat him. Uh, because there, we would always be seen as the outsiders propping up the South Saigon, the South Vietnam, Vietnamese regime, and, and not as the, uh, people, the people who really reflected the will, the will of Vietnamese people. In Afghanistan, I would argue that the Taliban was able to take on that mantle. And I don't want to go too much into Ukraine, but anybody who thinks it's really easy to subdue uh, a, uh, a nation by bringing in uh, powerful forces ought to at least think about the example of Vietnam. The Vietnamese constantly used a strategy that I refer to as self impalement. They were fighting much more powerful enemy. We were flying B-52s. The French were more powerful. But look what happened in Dien Bien Phu. Vietnamese were able to defeat the French. Look what happened to us. We certainly didn't win that war. Uh, they used the power of self-impalement. They used our own weight against us. I don't know what will happen in Ukraine. In the short term, it doesn't look good at all. But I think, uh, I think it's very hard to subdue are people who care about self-determination. To what extent do the aid programs that the remediation have done show a change in American interventionalism? And if we are faced with a similar situation today, do you think the U.S. would respond in a similar fashion it did originally to Vietnam? There's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, I think that our assistance programs in Vietnam were pretty, were, were pretty effective. We were able to deal first with what I just described, which is the legacies of war. And we spent, we used a, a lot of resources to address cleaning up unexploded ordnance, to address public health, including the health of people who've been affected by Agent Orange, and to deal with something the Vietnamese care very, very much about, which is their environment. Uh, the biggest part of the assistance program when I was ambassador was aimed at climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Uh, Vietnam is one of five countries that is most affected by climate change. And on a daily base, Viet basis, Vietnamese citizens are affected by the quality of the air and by what's happening in, uh, in terms of pollution uh, along the coast and in the countryside. So we were able to show by engaging in public health, dealing honestly with the past and the environment, that we weren't just interested in extraction. We weren't just interested in what we could get from a relationship with Vietnam. We were interested in how we could help people right down to the level of families. So I would argue that it was the, the dollars that we spent in uh, assistance in Vietnam were very well spent. Now, would, we, would the same thing happen today? Oh boy, I don't know. Um, it's it's hard to make an argument in Congress for assistance these days. Um, but there were people, at least in the case of Vietnam, there were people like Senator Patrick Leahy, John Kerry, and John McCain, and others who said, you know, we got to do what's right in a in a country where we've had this long and painful war. And they were willing to. And in fact, John Kerry uh, founded something that I think was very important, an American-style Vietnamese university in Ho Chi Minh City. It's called Fulbright University of Vietnam, and I was the 
founding vice president of that university. Uh, it was a chance for Vietnamese to learn in an American style environment how to think for themselves, how to question authority, and how to innovate. Because the success of that country, is, the success of our country, depends on the ability of young people to innovate. The young, middle-aged, old, anybody. <laughs> people, people to innovate. And you can't innovate if there isn't free flow of ideas and information. So that was an important, really important investment that was made by American people through their government in Vietnam's future. So I think there's some hopeful signs in terms of what we've done that might point to what we could do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this one's gonna be a little bit different from the other questions that you'll receive today. But I'd just like to ask, um, what is the biggest roadblock that you've faced in your career other than tackling the issue of Agent Orange and how did you exactly overcome that? Well, I'll tell you what it wasn't first and then I'll tell you what it was. So when I started in the State Department, in, um, the, in 1989, uh, there was a campaign to figure out who the gay people were in the State Department and take away their security clearances. And diplomatic security would show up, literally show up, people in trench coats would show up at the doors of parents of officers. I had a friend whose mom lived in Texas and a guy in a trench coat showed up and said, do you know your son is gay? And she said, you came here to tell me that? You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> so what we did, because we were being, we were losing our security clearances, and that means you lose your ability to do your job, is uh, we created an organization um, that at the time was called Gays and Lesbians and Foreign Affairs Agencies, and now has a more inclusive name. Uh, and we kept our membership list secret, we didn't want to lose our jobs. But we argued that we should be able to do our jobs. We were patriotic Americans. We wanted to serve our country. We should be able to do our jobs. And it took until the end of the first term of Bill Clinton's presidency before there was a policy of non-discrimination based on sexual orientation. So then, but that was a triumph. Then we switched focus and said, our families should be treated like other families. And the good news is, over time, it took till Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, but over time, that became reality. And so by the time, now when I came in, there was no way I could have imagined becoming an ambassador. And then by the time I was nominated, I thought, well, can I be confirmed? You know, who's going to go after me in the Senate? Will I be confirmed? And will the president back me up? This is before Obergefell. And um, I was confirmed, and it wasn't even an issue. I spoke Vietnamese, I knew the country, I was qualified. And that turned out to matter more than the fact that I was married to a man. Um, so that was, I, I feel like that was really, really, really positive change. So much so that then after the Obergefell decision in the Supreme Court that made my marriage to Clayton, legal in all 50 states, Ruth Bader Ginsburg paid a visit to Vietnam. And we said, come stay with us. She said, yes. And then we said, hey, it's our 10th anniversary. Would you be willing to perform a renewal of our vows, our wedding vows? And she said, yes, I'd love to. And so she did, and we had our two children with us. And marriage uh, means even more when there are children involved because you realize it's not just about the two of you it's about them so what we did initially as a political act to show the people of, of vietnam that you could be who you are and have a career and even make a difference in the world uh to something that was very meaningful personally to us but you asked also about obstacles the, the toughest thing i did as ambassador was deal with agent orange um, but I would say, before that, the toughest thing I did was deal with the environment in Thailand. And 
I went all out for an agreement with the Thai government to protect forests, tropical forests in Thailand. We had money, we had a great program, we had all the goodwill in the world, and it failed miserably. And it was all over the front pages. And I was a fairly junior officer, and my failure was there for everybody to see how much I had screwed up as a diplomat. Because I hadn't listened. I hadn't really, I was so convinced of the righteousness of our program, how good it was going to be for Thai tropical forests and the Thai environment, that I went ahead, even though people were saying, you know, a lot of Thais are really suspicious, and they think, actually, America's agenda is to steal the secrets to make our, our pharmaceutical companies richer. And I said, well, that's absurd. Of course we're not trying to do that. But I didn't listen. And it, it was a lesson that stayed with me absolutely every single day after that. You better listen to those with whom you want to, to work and accomplish things and do things together rather than tell them what's the right way to work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hello, sir. Uh, out of respect for the other questions, I'd ask for a quick response. Okay. So my quick question to you is, how did you start your work as an ambassador in the State Department? Uh, where did you start? And what did your young life choices lead you to government work, state work, or however that is defined? Thank you. And I will be brief because I, I see there are folks lined up. Um, I went, I took a gap year between high school and college, and I went and worked on a kibbutz in Israel. And I learned a little something about the Arab Israeli conflicts. I also traveled to Egypt and to Jordan and Lebanon and Syria. And I thought, hey, this is, there's this conflict, and it hasn't been fixed. And, you know, as an American, I think, well, if it's, there's a problem, we ought to be able to fix it. So I decided, well, I'm going to devote my life to fixing those problems. And first thing I'm going to do is fix the Arab-Israeli conflict. <laughs> I haven't done that. Um, but it made me think about diplomacy. And it is possible, in fact, it is possible for one person to make a difference and to help move in the direction of peace. Um, and so I chose diplomacy as a career. And I chose Asia instead of, I spoke Arabic, so I was like being steered towards the Middle East. But I chose Asia because I was a political officer and there were good stories coming out of Asia. It wasn't just about conflict or terrorism. There were, there were positive stories, there were inspiring stories coming out of Asia. So I went, my first tour was the Philippines and I never looked back. I, all, I stayed in Asia from then on. And I served, it. I lived in five Southeast Asian countries and also worked on China, India, Japan, and Korea. Um, and never was sorry because we have a chance in a place where the tectonic plates are moving, where things are dynamic, to make a difference. An individual can make a difference. So, again, how did you actually um, enter the State Department? Oh, okay. Like the mechanics of it. I where did you go college-wise? That was more oh, direction by okay. question. So I, I went to Harvard uh, as an undergrad, and I took the Foreign Service exam right after Harvard, and I flunked. And, um, and I took it again, and I flunked again. And I, but I was, you know, thought, well, wait, you know, I really think I should be a diplomat. So I went to Johns Hopkins and learned something about international economics, and then I passed. And that's the, that's the way to get into the Foreign Service, is take an exam. And, and it turns out the persistence actually pays off. Uh, I had a, a guy in my, my entering class who had taken it seven times, flunked six times, and finally passed it the seventh time around. But I think I was supposed to be a diplomat, so I'm glad I stuck with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, this question's going to be a little easier. Okay. So, uh, how, earlier you said that you uh, went to Vietnam and you, sorry, I was going to say sorry, uh, and you, uh, went and cleaned up the unexploded bombs. How, yes. What was the system you used to get rid of them, and how are you sure there are still none left? So the system was you find where they are. You take metal detectors and dogs. It turns out dogs can smell like uh, two meters down in the earth. They can they can find something. So they they take the metal detectors and the dogs. They figure out where the unexploded ordnance is, and then they blow it up in place. So I when I went. I would press a button and there would be an explosion over in the field, and boom, 
And then at one point they gave me the metal detector and I was walking through the field and I would go bzzz, and then I'd walk again and I'd go bzzz. Those were all places where we needed to blow up the unexploded ordnance. But they were able to do it in a way that was safe until the loss of the man I mentioned, Kid. There'd been years and years since someone had died uh, in trying to do the demining. Uh, and then I just read uh, a couple of months ago, another deminer died, but there have only been two in, I would say, the last 12 years. So they're very safe. They take, they do, they go through a process that's very safe, and they they blow it up to certain levels. If they think there's going to be farming in that area, well, then they blow it. They make sure they find unexploded ordnance to the depth of a plow. If they think buildings are going to be built, then they blow it up to the depth of a foundation, a building's foundation. Uh, doesn't mean they will remove all of it. It won't all be gone. And sometimes unexploded ordnance will rise to the surface because of the movement of water. And so they also have been engaged in an educational campaign to, to teach kids in particular, but also farmers, what this unexploded ordnance might look like. And don't touch it. Call us. We'll blow it up for you. All the dogs are okay, right? Thank you. Yeah, the dogs are okay. They, because they're, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. The dogs are okay. They also, they, these are very valuable dogs in every way. And so they use all kinds of techniques. I, as far as I know, there has never been a dog, a sniffer lost. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for coming here today. It's really appreciated by everyone in this room. Um, but as a member of the LGBTQ+, what are some of the largest struggles you face in your career? And do you think that because of your sexuality, you face more hardships trying to do your work in Vietnam? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, the hardships in my career were at the beginning, when it was hard to be myself. I never lied. In fact, when I went through my security clearance, um, I had uh, a couple of grad school friends who were very attractive young women, and they were going to be interviewed by the investigator, and I said, do not lie. But he took one look at them, and he thought, well, of course, the guy must be straight, because I had these, these attractive female friends. Well, it turns out gay people also have that attractive female friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he didn't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, early on, it was kind of hard to be myself, although I couldn't really not be. I didn't know how not to be. And, when I was asked by, uh, by high school students in Hue um, what my advice was to someone who might encounter difficulty as a result of being gay, I said, well, the only thing I can tell you is be yourself, because you'll be good at that, and you won't be good at trying to be somebody else. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, has, has held true. That it's turned out being myself was the best, the best possible choice, both for happiness and I would argue for my career. It didn't hurt. It turns out society changed enough by the time I became ambassador that it didn't hurt. Now, when I arrived in Vietnam, I didn't know how we would be received. My husband's black. Our kids are brown. They're Mexican-American. I'm a white guy. So, you know, we're a typical American family. Um, and Barack Obama asked me, you know, well, tell me about your family. And I did. He said, oh, it sounds like the Benetton ad. <laughs> But what we found was when we showed up, by being ourselves, people were able to relate to us. My, we arrived with my mother, who was in her mid-80s at the time, and was helping us with our, our, our infant son. And um, we made sure that the first picture that was published in the newspaper, it was Clayton holding our, our baby boy, and my mother was there, and I was there. And they could see what our family looked like. Because I thought, I'm going to start from the first minute being clear about who we are. You know, we were welcomed with open arms in that conservative society everywhere. And I can't tell you the number of times that uh, we'd be out in a restaurant or traveling, and someone would come up and say, you know, I saw these pictures of you, and I came out to my parents. Or I saw these pictures of you, and I decided I'm going to be who I am at work. And we worked with the LGBT plus community in Vietnam to adopt their strategies, not to tell them what they should do, but to help them by showing up, pursue what they thought was, was important in changing their society. 
Thank you. So earlier in your speech, you kind of explained how the war with Vietnam and the United States after after the war it brought peace. Do you think that would happen with Ukraine and Russia that eventually it would bring peace between them? I hope so. Um, what I wish Putin understood was that uh, you know history shows that people won't give up. He may decapitate the leadership. I saw a picture today of Zelensky and his wife and their two kids. So it's not it's not abstract this idea of decapitating the leadership. He may do it, he may succeed. And you know, there's a 40 mile convoy waiting to go into Kiev. He's not gonna suddenly turn that around that convoy and say, oh, we, made it, we decided to do it differently. He's gonna double down. But the people aren't gonna give up. They there's a long history in the Ukraine. Uh, resisting foreign invaders, especially those from Russia. Just as there was a long history in Vietnam of resisting foreign invaders, whether they came from China or France or the United States. And invaders tend to find out that it's harder than they expect to hold on to territory if people don't want them there. So I don't know how long this will take. I don't know, I don't know, you know, what course it will take. I'm not terribly optimistic. I thought like McKinley was honest with you yesterday when he said it's actually, people are saying it's taking longer for Russia. It's only been five days. Um, I, I don't think it's going to go well in the short term. And in the long term, I think uh, Putin has made an, a, a terrible mistake. Harmed the world and harmed his own country by, by the mistake that he's made. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so you had mentioned that you worked under four presidents, and I was wondering, considering the relative frequency with which U.S. presidents change and their sometimes radically differing views, how that impacted your work? Thank you for that question. So um, I, I'm a Democrat. Um, I'll say it. <laughs> uh, and actually, when you're in the Foreign Service, you're discouraged from talking too much about what party you, you belong to. Um, but I've always been a Democrat. So when uh, George W. Bush was pre became president, and I didn't support the war in Iraq, I thought about leaving. And then I worked on Korea policy. And the policy of especially Dick Cheney was to loathe Kim Jong-un. Well, that's a very legitimate sentiment, but it's a really crappy policy. Uh, it's, if you want to be an effective diplomat, negotiations are a lot better than loathing. I, I, we loathe Vladimir Putin. So what? You really you need a strategy. And at a certain point, I had to go and give a speech at my alma mater at Harvard. And the motto there is Veritas. And I thought, well, if I tell the truth, I'm probably going to get fired. But I couldn't face those students and not tell the truth. So I did. And I didn't get fired. It was quite amazing. And then, uh, and then two-thirds of the way through my tour in Vietnam, and when you're ambassador, by the way, you are the personal representative of the president. The president who nominated me, Barack Obama, I agreed with on pretty much everything to do with Vietnam policy. And then all of a sudden, I was working for a very different president. And the first thing he did as president was withdraw the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. And I had worked on that for, for years of my life and brought Vietnam into that trade agreement. And I thought the policy was wrong. And then he unfurled the Muslim ban. And then he withdrew us from the Paris Climate Accords. And it was kind of one thing after another. Then he called certain countries shithole countries. <laughs> and, um, you know, I actually believe that effective diplomacy requires showing respect. When you call someone, a <laughs> they're coming from a shithole country, that's not very respectful. So um, I found it difficult to make that transition. And um, I offered my resignation. Right? Actually, on the day he was elected, I offered my resignation. And it wasn't accepted. And then my, and I told the students yesterday, my staff came to me and said, Ambassador, 
you think it was hard before and we needed your leadership. It's really going to be hard now and we need your leadership. Don't leave. And I thought, well, all right, I'll stay as long as I can hold on to my ethical core. Because to me, what's really important is to be able to look my kids in the face and say, Papa did the right thing. And if you can't pass that test, none of the other ones matter. So as long as I could, I stayed and I fought for a relationship that I believed in. And we were able to fend off some very bad things by, by sticking it out. And then the, the time came uh, about 10 months into Trump's presidency where I was asked to do things that I thought were so wrong that I couldn't do them. And uh, I offered my own resignation, and that time it was accepted. So actually, I was preparing for a visit by President Trump to Vietnam. And six days before the visit, uh, the White House said, so we want somebody in there who's a little more malleable. So I left, and someone else came in. Um, but I, I feel like I did all that I could you know, to hold on to my principles for as long as I could. And then the thing that, that I was really objected to the most, I went public about. And it made me very unpopular in the Trump administration. And there was no way I could have gone back into, the, into government service after that. Um, and in fact, I lost a second job as a result. But I'm not sorry, because I brought to light what I thought was a really insidious policy. It involved deporting people who were not white, deporting them back to the country they came from, people who had fled South Vietnam, deporting them to new, newly united Vietnam, where they didn't, you know, they didn't know anybody, uh, and to, where a flag flew that they hated. Um, but this was, a this was a policy that was driven by a guy named Stephen Miller, a senior advisor to the president. I thought it was wrong, and I objected and objected and objected, and I quit because at a certain point, the president is the one who decides, and the individual diplomat doesn't. And I went public and I exposed what they were doing because they were trying to hide it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one more question. So, um, I wanted to say thank you for talking about Agent Orange poisoning. Um, my grandfather had Agent Orange poisoning and was supposed to cause his death. But um, what, like, what, what birth defects? Like, sorry. Um, what, what birth defects and Effects do you think are like the worst caused by? Well, I visited a lot of kids. Is that the answer to you want me to describe what the effects are like? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are 15 different potential symptoms of exposure to dioxin. But I can just tell you what I felt. I visited a lot of kids. Um, who had who had been born with birth defects caused by Agent Orange, and they had terribly mangled limbs or eyes bulging, blind eyes bulging from their heads, or huge heads. Um, many could not function in any in any way, but were being cared for um, sometimes by their families and sometimes by the state. And um, you know, we did that. We caused that to happen. Um, I think we probably went to Vietnam with the best of intentions, you know, save those people from godless communism. But look what the results were. And these results that, you know, go on and on. And your grandfather and many, many other American soldiers were exposed to Agent Orange, and they passed that on to their children. Um, I went on a, a bicycle ride. I loved bike. I rode, rode bike a couple times the length of the country. And um, with John Kerry and Pete Peterson, who's the first ambassador, I, I biked with a group of veterans. Uh, and many of those people have been affected one way or another. There were two blind people on that ride who, who rode 1,200 miles blind. 
there were people who had lost their limbs, not because of Agent Orange, but for one reason or another had lost their limbs and went on over the high Vaughan Pass on, on hand cycles. It's at 1,200 miles, and the mountains are really steep. Um, they showed a lot of courage, and they came in the spirit of reconciliation to, and to show that even people with disabilities can do amazing, amazing things. And so I'm always inspired. There's a guy named Cho, and there's an a Academy Award-winning film called Cho Beyond the Lines, and he suffers from Agent Orange, and he paints with his teeth. He paints the most beautiful paintings. And he's this completely winning person. He won't be defined by his disability. But we, we caused what curtailed his life. I regret that. Thank you. Thank you.